The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, welcome to Coffee with Coffee. Um, I'm delighted to have Matt Baker as our presenter today. Matt's been in the industry for uh, a number of years, maybe I shouldn't say how many years. I don't want to make you feel old, but uh, he's certainly a friend of the industry and one of the uh, favorite trainers out in the, uh, out in the field. Uh, knowledgeable, fun, and funny. So I think you're going to enjoy this uh, presentation today as content. So today that Matt's going to be talking about, a lot of the slides, a lot of the information that he's going to be using is coming out of these back issues, number 15 that we did on separation, 16 we did a couple of years ago on circulation, and uh, issue number 21 that's on the thermal setter. So I think, hit me one more time, that might be it. So there's our guy right there, the smiling face out in front of their building in uh, Denver. Uh, Matt now works for uh, TM Sales, uh, rep of the year by the way, congratulations from the, uh, from the magazine. So um, impress us with your knowledge, Matt. Take it away. Okay. Can you hear me now? <laughs> like Very the Verizon fun. guy walking around. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. We've got a live audience, a live studio audience here. Um, they'll clap and applaud on cue. So look forward to that. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to the topic of smart pumps. Now, we've been talking about these for quite a few years now. Uh, I think um, they're widely being adopted into more and more hydronic systems and so today we're going to go over uh, what makes these smart as we call them smart pumps we're going to talk about the different control modes and how they operate in different types of systems when do we use what kind of control mode uh, and we're going to talk about some things such as you know maintenance uh, service requirements are there places where you don't necessarily need a smart pump and if they do indeed cost more money, uh, do they save money in the long run? So those are several of the topics. Again, if you have any questions out there across the interwebs, type them in to Bob and he'll, he'll get those to us and we'll get those answered. Uh, we've got an, an audience poll that we're gonna conduct here. Uh, so briefly, if we could take just a second and see if we can get any feedback from the audience of the circulators that you install and or specify, what percentage of those are smart pumps? As we talk about this, your options, we've got more than 75%, which is what nerdy pump guys like me like to see. But of course, uh, these are relatively new technology in the grand scheme of things. So they continue to grow on a daily basis. So yeah, it looks like uh, quite a bit out there just less than 25% um, of pumps that you install are being uh, smart pumps. So obviously there's room for room for uh, growth and part of that is understanding how these pumps actually work. So we're gonna move through that today. I don't know how many people out there remember the great, I call him the great comedian, George Carlin. So George Carlin did a lot of good stuff in his days and one thing he did is he always talked about dogs. He said, I love dogs. The thing, I, the favorite thing about dogs is he said, you know, you can, you can find the breed you like and you just stick with that forever. So he said, my favorite dog lived to be 18 years old and finally died. And he said, I didn't take it to the vet. I took it into the pet store, threw it on the counter and said, that was a good dog. Give me another one just like it. Well, that happens with pumps every day on the wholesaler's counter where a pump dies and we walk it into the counter we throw it down and say that was a good pump and just like it but 18 years has gone by right so 18 years ago I was walking around with a Nokia flip phone and worried about the Y2K bug uh, so nobody had ever heard of iPod 18 years ago right so a lot of things have changed in that time period and so we move from pumps like you see here to uh, newer style, what we're going to call smart pumps or electrocommutated pumps. So let's look at what makes these pumps actually work. And there's a couple of primary components. So ECM, if you're familiar with that terminology, refers to the type of motor. Stands for electronically commutated motor or electronically controlled motor. And as part of that, you've got a component in the middle. Somebody's out there which is the permanent magnet rotor assembly. And then we're gonna combine that with the electronic part or the brains of the whole operation. So if we looked at an ECM pump on the inside, on the, on the uh, left is the stator for an ECM type motor. You'll notice it's not 
copper windings just wound around in a ball around that stator housing. They actually have poles. In this case, this is a six pole winding. And you'll notice that those poles um, are opposite each other. So we would energize the opposite poles. You get a north and a south polarity, if you will. And then you've got the magnetic rotor assembly on the right hand side of your screen. And that's a, we've got a guy here that has beautiful hands. So he was our hand model for this picture. Um, wasn't me. <laughs> so, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so this is a 12 inch adjustable crescent wrench. So you can tell that's a pretty strong magnet to hold that thing. Um, and so with that permanent magnet and with the, the ability to control the magnetic polarity of the motor, we can now adjust the speed at which that rotor spins. So that is the first part of the smart pump. Now let's talk about the brains of the operation, right? So you'll notice some of these pumps have displays on them that display wattage, GPM, other information potentially. And so the question when these pumps first came to the US was how do these pumps know what they're doing? And uh, a lot of guys out there didn't really understand it. They said, put it in there and it speeds up and slows down. And you'll, know, yeah, but how does it work? Well, it's magic. Well, we've come to find out that it's not magic, in fact, it's math. And so when we're talking about sensorless smart pumps, really what we're talking about is a mathematical calculation of how these pumps are working. So you say, well, how does this pump with a display on it know what its GPM and feet of head is? So let's walk through that. So if I've got a pump and I'm a, say, pump designer, I'm not just gonna build a pump volute, cast it, an impeller, slap it on a motor and see what it does as far as G performance, GPM and feet ahead. I'm going to set out to design a pump for a specific operating point and then attempt to make it as efficient as possible. And in doing so, um, you start basically on the wet end of the pump. So on the left side is what is referenced as WHP, that's water horsepower. Okay. And then you take into account the efficiency of that pump. That is with every rotation of the impeller, one rotation, how much water actually leaves the volute or the pump versus how much stays in it, right? So there's no such thing as a 100% efficient pump. You're gonna have recirculation that occurs inside the volute. You'll have some friction losses that occur. So take those accounts into fact, take those factors into account and you come up with the efficiency of the pump and that would be the line in the center referencing brake horsepower. So I've got my water horsepower, and I'll explain that more deeply here in a second. In the middle, I've got my brake horsepower. That's going to take into account the inefficiencies inside the pump. And then the motor is not 100% efficient. So on this end, on the far right, is electrical horsepower. So all of these items here are related to each other. And I'll show you that when we start with water horsepower, okay? So if I wanted to design a pump and figure out uh, how much electrical horsepower I have to put on the other end to drive that pump, I'm gonna start on this end and say, okay, and to get my water horsepower is basically, I'm gonna take my GPM times my feet of head times specific gravity. Now for our math today, Specific gravity is 1.0 based all on water, right? If we did glycol or I'm working at a local chocolate factory where they want to pump chocolate and that has a different specific gravity than water. So, but we can figure out all of those things, right? And so we plug in these calculations where I, to figure out my water horsepower requirement, I would take my GPM times speed ahead divided by 3960 and that's going to give me a net number of water horsepower required. My next step is to take into account the efficiency of the pump. Once again, how much water leaves the volute with every rotation of the impeller. So if I wanted to determine my brake horsepower, it's simply my water horsepower divided by the pump efficiency. Okay. 
Okay, so now I need to figure out how big the motor has to be on the other end to run that pump, taking into account the efficiency of the pump and the actual GPM and feet ahead that we want to move. So the final step in that equation is, is to find out actual electrical horsepower required. And electrical horsepower is simply brake horsepower divided by the efficiency of the motor. So you see I've started on one end, that is water horsepower, that's GPM times feet ahead divided by 3960, then divided by the efficiency of the pump gives me brake horsepower, divide that by the efficiency of the motor, and now I've got my electrical horsepower. So what if I had a brain down here, that would be the computer monitoring the electrical horsepower? If that computer knows the efficiency of the motor, could it not reverse calculate the brake horsepower? And if it knows the efficiency of the pump at that point, it could reverse calculate to water horsepower. And if I can re reverse calculate to water horsepower, I can get bound to GPM and feet ahead. So how do these pumps know to display that flow rate on the back? It's not magic, it's math. Simply, they monitor electrical horsepower, and it reverse calculates, taking into account brake horsepower, and then finally plotting it on its pump curve to get its flow rate. Simple, right? Maybe not, but. <laughs> now, I'll point out here, let me go back one slide. You say, well, if it can reverse calculate, how does it know when something in the system changes? That is, let's say in this case, a zone valve closes. Well, if this was a fixed speed pump, if a zone valve closed from this operating point, you'll see the water horsepower is plotted up there in the middle of that curve. Once I close a valve, the pump's gonna ride up on its pump curve. But notice what happens to the electrical horsepower, that is the amp draw, so to speak, there at the bottom, it goes down. So this is your electrical horsepower line, that blue line. And it was up here, so much higher. So now when we're moving less water, we're actually drawing less power. And so the computer recognizes that, wait a minute, I'm going the same speed, I'm drawing less amps or electrical horsepower, and it's able to reverse calculate again and replot itself. So as a general rule of thumb, more flow is more amps, less flow is less amps. So if the, if the pump recognizes that change in electrical horsepower, it's gonna recognize that something adjusted in the system, i.e. a zone valve either closed or open. Now there's other types of pumps out there that are not sensorless pumps. So in this case, we're showing a uh, this is a Grunfoss Magna 3, and it's got a built-in pressure differential sensor. So we've all been to jobs where you've got your pump, and usually you've got some pressure gauges on the suction and discharge side, so you can kind of figure out what that pump is doing. Well, essentially, this is the same thing. The pump is monitoring through a differential sensor the pressure on the suction side of that pump and the discharge side of that pump. And it's doing the calculation, as I noted here, which is PSI differential times 2.31 equals your feet of head. Once again, we're not taking into account specific gravity in this calculation. So if I've got a pump with pressure gauges across it, and I've got a reading of a pressure differential, simply to tell, to tell what that pump is doing, I would take the pressure differential times 2.31, that's gonna give me a feet of head rating. So then I'll go over to my pump curve, and I'll notice I've got whatever feet of head my reading was, I'll follow it out to where it intersects the pump curve. And then you'll follow that down to the bottom to get your GPM. So pumps with sensors are directly sensing what that pressure differential is and determining what the flow rate is. So let's get into systems more specifically. And this is critical to understand how these smart pumps are operating in your systems. So we've got three key factors that you've got to consider 
when you want to know how these pumps are going to operate. The first one is system curves. What is a system curve? Well, the system curve is, is what I call the fingerprint of the system. That is, once we're moving water through pipes, we're creating friction loss, and we can identify exactly where that pump is operating. Think of it as uh, sitting in traffic, right? We've all been there. Uh, so in this case, the more resistance in a system, that is the more flow that you try to put through the pipes, the more resistance you get in the system. And the opposite is true, the less flow, the less resistance. So if I was, guy, if I was the guy on the picture here heading southbound in the bumper to bumper traffic, that's because we're putting more cars through that system, through that pipe, if you will, the highway, than it was designed to hold. And so your resistance increases dramatically. That is, we're in bumper to bumper traffic, honking and waving nicely at people. The guys on the other side heading northbound don't have any resistance. There's not a lot of cars on that road. And so there's very little resistance. So they can go as fast as they want to, right? Till they get pulled over, like I did yesterday. Just kidding. So you'll notice that there are any number of system curves that can exist in your system. So in this case, we're showing an example of a three zone system, okay? And that far right system curve shows what the design, what our flow rate would be and what our friction loss would be where it intersects the pump curve over here where it says three zones at this point. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, what this is showing you is with three zones open, this is my system curve. But when another, another zone closes, my system curve moves and it, it moves to the middle of that pump curve. And with one zone open, you've got a different system curve. So the key is to figure out where the system curve intersects the pump curve. And that's gonna help us determine uh, control modes as we're going to go into okay so the the second critical component is pump curves okay so in this case you'll see a lot of the ecm smart pumps with pump curves that look similar to this this is not a it doesn't have the same look and feel as a traditional pump curve nice smooth arc line all the way down but what we'll notice is the, the top pump curve is the max rpm and the bottom pump curve is the minimum RPM. And whether I have all three zones open or two zones or one zone, you can follow that down to whichever pump curve that the pump is operating on. And you'll notice I have different flow rates. So if this pump was maximum RPM with one zone open, it'd be operating up here. If it was minimum RPM with one zone open, it would be operating down here. So you'll notice that depending on the speed of the pump, it changes the pump curve and that intersects the corresponding system curve. So here's the trick, control curves. This is primarily where a lot of the confusion comes into place in the market is where do I set this control curve? Which type of control curve do I use? So in this case, we're showing that same three zone system and we're showing a control curve, which is the flat line. That is the set point that we tell that pump to maintain as things open and close in the system. So uh, we're going to go over this constant pressure line, but as a broad statement, you'll have this straight line and you've got this same three zone system. So as the zones open and close, what happens is if I've got three zones open and one zone closes, the pressure is going to go up. The pump's going to want to ride up on its pump curve. The pump senses that it's moving less water and it's against more pressure, and that tells the pump to slow down. So it's going to slow down until it hits its control curve. And you'll notice control curve intersects with system curve. Another zone closes. It's going to go increase pressure because we're pumping against a closed valve. The pump will recognize that change and then it's going to slow itself down to its control curve. And you'll notice again, control curve intersects system curve, and that's where it's going to operate. The opposite happens when a zone valve opens, by the way. If I'm operating with one zone open, 
and all of a sudden the second zone opens, the pressure is gonna drop because now I'm moving water to new places. So the pressure drops, the pump recognizes the pressure change and it increases until it hits its control curve again. So it's just gonna sit there and do that as these zones open and close. And there's a wide combination. If in a three zone system, I believe there's 14 different combinations of zones open and close. So that's 14 different potential system curves that they're all going to intersect the control curve at some point between the minimum and the maximum system curve. Hey, Matt, can I put a question in there that just got typed in? What happens if all three zones are closed? Where, where are we going? So if all three zones are closed, in this case, if we leave the pump on, okay, you could turn the pump off, but if we leave the pump on, it's gonna run down to zero flow and it will still maintain whatever set point that control curve is set at. So that would be known as deadheading. Generally, deadheading is bad on pumps, right? Um, but it, with the ECM type pumps, they don't generate a whole lot of heat from the motor. So when you deadhead a normal pump at a fixed speed, if all three zones were closed, we would be running clear up here in the, it's kind of hard to see, 27 feet ahead range. So that's somewhere in the 12, 13 PSI. So you've got this pump that's sitting here creating 13 PSI and it's not moving any water. That water heats up, the motor heats up, and that's bad news for a lot of pumps. In this case, that, that pump will just run down to wherever that set point is at zero flow. So it's not gonna be creating all that extra pressure, heating up the water, burning up the motor. So ECM nice. is much more, um, much more resilient against closed valve situations. I've actually got pumps that were installed, boy, probably 10 years ago that have never been shut off, that run baseboard heat up in the mountains. So there's a good, you know, two, three months that it runs against closed valves and it's still running to this day. So, of course, if you can shut it off, shut it off. So let's talk about common control modes. Now there's other types of manufacturers that make different types of control modes in addition to what you see here. But the most common control modes that you see are constant curve, okay, that's a fixed speed if you will, constant differential pressure, proportional differential pressure, constant temperature, and constant differential temperature. So let's talk about those and where we would use them versus uh, maybe where a different mode would fit better. So imagine if I've got a pump that was designed to operate in the middle of this curve, that's my design point. So in, a, in, the, in the real world, we do the best we can as engineers or sizing pumps to determine in advance what our flow rate and our head capacity is gonna be. But at the end of the day, uh, usually that ends up being a little fluffy, if you will. So there's a lot of safety factors built into every kind of chart that we use to determine friction loss and things like that. So if I were to sit down and do my very best job designing a pump to operate at a flow and head, once that pump is actually installed, most of the time it runs out along its pump curve to a different operating point. This is before a pump is balanced, so to speak. And so we've seen circuit setters, triple duty valves, things like that used on pumps so that we can throttle that flow back to the design point, right? And so what happens is that pump is installed, it's designed to operate here. It operates where I've got it noted as the installed operating point. And then we've got a balancing contractor that will come by and balance balance the valve, close the valve mechanically, which makes the pump operate at that design flow. And so what we've done by mechanically balancing, we've throttled a valve and we've created additional friction loss so that we can get it to run at the point we wanted it to run. In the case of a pump that is ECM variable speed, we don't need to mechanically throttle. We don't have to add friction loss to get it to run at the flow rate that it needs to. We simply turn down the speed of the pump, we adjust the pump curve, if you will, to run at the point that we need the flow. 
So instead of throttling this pump back to here, you simply slow the pump down. And once again, there's that, there's that system curve keeps popping up, right? If we slow the pump down, it's gonna go down along that system curve and it's gonna run at what I call the actual operating point. That is, we've taken out all the additional friction loss that we didn't need to have in the system and we're still operating at our design flow rate. So now we're accomplishing everything we wanted to. We've got the pump running where we need it. We've got it running at the right speed. And by the way, we've just electronically balanced that pump to run where we need it. We're not wasting energy by throttling a valve, okay? And on average, in my experience, the difference between throttling a pump back and actually slowing it down and running where it needs to is approximately 30% reduction in power. So you're, you're saving money essentially by running this pump where it should. So that's the constant curve mode. Um, there are definitely places for that. If you're in a constant flow situation, I need this flow whenever, whenever I need this pump, I need 50 GPM, then I'm gonna electronically control that. But again, we're not wasting energy by throttling any valves. <clears throat> So we're gonna go on to variable speed control modes. So what you see here is constant pressure differential. I should have noted that in the top of that slide. This is the difference across the pump. If you'll remember those pressure gauges that I showed you on that picture of the pump, this is constant pressure differential across that pump. And this is a straight line curve. So this is gonna tell the pump no matter what happens in the system, I want you to speed up and slow down to maintain this feet of head or this pressure differential across the pump. So this mode is, uh, basically this mode was one of the first types of control modes when pumps started being put on VFDs. And typically you would go and put a sensor two thirds out in the line, you'd me measure the pressure differential out there, send a signal back, through the BMS or whatever to tell the VFD to speed the pump up or slow it down to maintain that fixed pressure differential. And a little later here, we're going to go over what types of systems may require constant pressure differential versus, <clears throat> excuse me, versus other types of modes that, that are to follow. So essentially in constant pressure differential, you'll see you've got three zone valves in this system. And if all three zone valves are open, this pump is going to run out here to its max curve and it's going to go 100% speed. So it's going to intersect with the system curve down here. So the pump is going as fast as it can. Maybe it can't maintain this set point, but it's going to run until it intersects that system curve every time. Then when the second valve closes, rather than the pump running up here on its curve, it's going to, it's going to exceed our set point for that constant differential set point. And once it exceeds that, that tells the pump to slow down. So the pump slows down until it intersects that second system curve. And the same thing occurs when another valve closes. So now we've got just one valve open. So when that second valve closes, the pressure wants to increase. The pump recognizes the increase in that pressure differential and slows itself down to maintain our set point. That's constant pressure differential. It's a good mode. A lot of manufacturers have gone to other types of control modes in both, uh, probably two efforts. One is to get even more efficient, save even more energy. Uh, but the second is to have a very smoothly operating system. So we're not creating addit additional pressure that we don't need. So we're gonna look at this mode called the proportional pressure control. Um, if you look at a lot of these manufacturers manuals or even the label on the pump, I call this the windshield wiper mode. It kind of looks like a windshield wiper on that crooked line. So if you look at proportional pressure control, we can still have, and you'll notice this dashed line is versus constant pressure in the same system, okay? So we've still got the same exact system, but we're gonna set it on proportional pressure control. And what proportional pressure control is, is basically think of it like a reset, okay? We do outdoor reset on boilers. The warmer it gets, the cooler our boiler gets, right? 
This is a pump reset type function. That is, as you slow the flow down through pipes, the friction loss goes down by the square. So we want to track some of that friction loss and pick up additional energy savings. So if I'm in proportional pressure mode, you'll notice that it goes down and to the left. And so at this point on the far right, that would be your proportional pressure set point. Okay, let's just call that for an example, 20 feet ahead. Typically proportional pressure control modes are 50% of whatever that set point is at zero flow. So if I'm 20 feet of head out here at zero flow, I'm at 10 feet of head down here. So you'll notice I'm reducing the pressure output of the pump as I reduce the flow to the system. Okay. A lot of that uh, is to save more energy, but notice this in constant pressure mode with one zone open, I'm operating right here in proportional pressure mode. I'm operating at a little less flow rate and less feet of head. So it's going to intersect and provide a little less flow and less head more energy savings. But if you're in a system where you've got a real small zone and you don't want to over pump that zone, when you have just one small zone calling, you don't necessarily need a whole lot of constant pressure up here. You'd rather be operating down here. So years ago, pumps were really noisy. Why? Because they were over pumping under minimal load conditions. And that was too noisy for the homeowner. So the homeowner said, fix this or else, right? So you got to go back in and you put in a pressure differential bypass valve because you've got to eliminate the extra pressure that's being created by the pump that's not being required by the system. In this case, we're not creating the additional pressure. So you don't run into having to have that pressure differential bypass valve. And hopefully you don't get any complaints from the homeowner. Uh, next control mode that we're going to talk about is constant temperature mode. So typically this is gonna be used in, the, in our instance here, we're showing an example of a domestic hot water recirculation line, okay? And as a general rule, recirc lines are sized for 10 degree differential. So if I'm sending 120 degrees out of my tank, uh, indirect or wherever my source is, if I'm 120 degrees out, I want 110 degrees back on the recirc line so that I can ensure that I've got hot water throughout the entire system. So in a constant temperature type mode, the pump would be installed on the return line, like this one shown here, and you would set it to maintain 10 degrees below whatever that supply temperature is. So that pump would recognize the temperature coming back to the, to the sensor on the pump, and it would speed up and slow down to maintain that 10 degree differential. Think about when that pump is actually needed. When do we need a research pump in a system? So if you're in a hotel and you wake up in the morning and everybody's taking showers between six and 9 a.m., do we need a research pump to be running at that time? The answer is no, because the hot water usage in the building is keeping that water hot in the pipes. But two or three o'clock in the afternoon, it's only the cleaning crew using water, uh, maybe I stayed out too late and slept in and I go to hop in the shower, that's the time when I need a pump to keep hot water in the research line because there hasn't been enough usage to keep that line hot all day long. So the way that pump sees it is when there's usage, hot water is already returning to that pump. So it's going to slow down. It says, okay, I don't need to be working right now because the hot water in the system is, is sufficient. And then in the afternoon, as that pipe starts to cool down the water in the pipe, the pump says, I need to work a little harder to get this hot water all the way through. This is a very good way to control a hot water recirculation system. And I'll show you a, another here shortly. And, uh, and now we'll talk about delta T or constant temperature differential. Now there's long been a debate. In fact, I had many pre-submitted questions that said delta P, delta T. My answer is, is that uh, there are better modes for better systems. So take, for example, this type of system. If I've got a distribution loop that's servicing multiple buildings, for example, 
So I've got a loop that's just running around in a circle. And these buildings in this example would be these secondary circuits with closely spaced T's that are pulled off of there, right? Well, if I've got closely spaced T's, and being this is Kalefi discussion, we know about hydraulic separation. If I've got closely spaced T's, I've got very little to no pressure drop across these T's. So how is a pressure-based pump gonna know to speed up or slow down in this type of system? It's not, because the pressure differential is always gonna stay the same. We don't have valves opening and closing. And so the best way to, to monitor that is, if these were individual buildings pulling off of this distribution loop, they're using certain amount of heat, right? And that's that heat is being reflected in the return water temperature. That is the BTUs that that building is using. So as these individual circuits use more or less heat, BTUs, temperature, right? Then my return water temperature is gonna, is gonna vary. And so now if, I, if I'm measuring my delta T across this system, I actually know how many BTUs are being used and that tells the pump to speed up or slow down accordingly. So there are definitely instances in which you would want to monitor temperature uh, because your options for monitoring pressure are limited. What if you're in a building with full of fan coils and they all have three-way valves on them? Again, we may have minimal pressure differential change throughout that system. So we could go through and do close off a bunch of those valves so that we do see pressure differential changes when the fan coils open and close, or uh, we could measure temperature in that system. We could still run efficiently. Also, another popular control mode out there in the field uh, is controlling these pumps via an analog signal. Typically, this is tied into a building management system, and they'd be giving a pump in this example, a zero to 10 volt control signal. And in that case, these pumps are running just on constant curve mode, but that curve changes based on that zero to 10 volt input that it's receiving from the building management system. 10 volts being maximum, zero volts being minimum. Usually it's zero volts is minimum, zero is not off. Generally speaking in these smart pumps, if you want them off, you have to turn them off as far as a start stop relay okay so generally speaking zero volts is minimum 10 volts is maximum and they're controlling that speed anywhere in between according to whatever parameters they're measuring so let's talk the real world right so we can sit and go through you know hypotheticals all day but let's talk about real world applications so if I asked anybody in this room or on this webinar, do you know when to use constant pressure differential versus proportional pressure differential? Would it be an overwhelming yes or an overwhelming no? I got guys looking at me with like deer in the headlights in this room, folks. So what we're gonna talk about is when to use which type of mode, what type of systems do we encounter so that we know what to do? So take into account two primary considerations know what mode to use. These are pressure-based modes. The first consideration is the, the head loss in your individual zone, okay? The second consideration is the head loss in your distribution piping. So the way that those relate to one another is gonna determine which type of mode that we wanna use. For example, now here's where the nerdy pump guy in me comes out, right? So now we're gonna go back and do a little math. So if I stick with the same three zone concept, you'll notice that I've got listed up here, GPM requirement of five feet, uh, excuse me, five GPM for zone one, 10 GPM for zone two, and 15 GPM for zone three. That gives me a total requirement of 30 gallons per minute. Now let's look at the head loss, right? So in the head loss for zone one, it's two feet ahead. Zone two is five feet ahead and zone three is six feet ahead. So the highest head loss in that zone, in any of those zones is six feet ahead. Fair enough. 
now I've got distribution loss in my distribution piping of 15 feet ahead. Say so running a long way to get where it needs to go. So if I resize this pump, the total requirement for this pump, the design point would be 30 gallons per minute, 21 feet of head. So I pick my pump out and I go and say, okay, I've got a pump that does 30 gallons per minute, 21 feet ahead. That's where that red dot is on the far right. What happens though, when I close zone three, zone three is the 15 gallon a minute zones. So now I've cut my flow rate requirement in half, right? Well, what happens is I still need 15 GPM and I still need to overcome the head loss in the biggest zone. In that case, three is off. So I'd have five feet of head loss in zone two that I need to overcome. And then your distribution loss, here's the trick. The distribution piping loss goes down by the square of the reduction in flow. So if I've cut my flow in half, my friction loss goes in half and in half again. So if I'm at 15 feet ahead friction loss in my distribution piping and I cut my flow in half, I went to seven and a half and then 3.75. So my total head requirement has gone down from 20 feet ahead to 8.75. Well, let's plot that on the pump curve and we go and look at that middle dot there. That's where that now has to operate. Let's shut that second zone off. So we're operating only the one zone, five gallons per minute, two feet of head. My distribution loss, since my flow rate is now one sixth of what it was, that distribution loss is gonna go to one sixth of uh, square reductions. So it's basically one feet ahead, let's just call it negligible. So very low feet of head. And then I've got two feet ahead in my zone. And I plot that on my pump curve and you'll notice it's down here below the minimum. But if we're in a proportional pressure control curve, that curve is gonna be slightly above here. But you'll notice how as we change the flow rates, as those zones open and close, the friction loss goes down dramatically because the majority of friction loss in this instance is in the distribution piping. This layout on the pump curve looks very similar to this, doesn't it? That's our proportional pressure control mode. Okay, let's take another example. I've got three zones. I like sticking with the three zone example. So, but let's say, for example, say I got three zones and they're all the exact same, whatever they are heat pumps, whatever. They're all 10 gallons per minute, 18 feet of head. And I'm in a very short run of pipe to feed them. So I've only got three feet of head loss in my distribution piping. Look what this is total requirement for that system 30 gallons per minute, 21 feet ahead. It's the exact same pump that we just sized on that previous system. But let's look how it operates. As we close down the first, the, the third zone, our flow goes down to 20 GPM. Okay. We still need 18 feet of head to cover that. The, the friction loss in the zones. And then my distribution loss goes down by, you know, a third and a third. So it goes to 1.33. But after the, after that zone closes, I've got a requirement of 20 gallons per minute at 19.3 feet ahead. So I'm still pretty high up here, right? On that middle dot. And then I close down that other valve. So I've got one zone open. I still need 10 gallons per minute. I still need 18 feet of head. My distribution friction loss is 0.33, so it's negligible, but it's still pretty high on this pump curve, if you'll notice. So as these three dots are more in line with a constant pressure control mode, it's more of a straight line. So that is where the distribution piping is higher, you know, significantly higher than the zones is proportional pressure where the distribution piping is significantly less than the zones, you would wanna look at constant pressure. Also, I like to say in a, as a general rule, if I have a system with a series of similar loads, right? If I'm in an apartment complex and they all have the same size fan coil unit, I'm gonna do constant pressure differential. Okay, unless it's again, long distance runs, but 
generally speaking, a bank of similar loads, you would use constant pressure differential. So let's look at some, uh, some items here that work perfectly with a pressure-based pump. So if I've got a smart pump, if you will, and it's in a system and it doesn't have a temperature sensor built in, right? So we can't control this smart pump on temperature mode because it doesn't either accept the sensor or it's not a built-in mode. What you could do is with the use of the Kalefi thermo setter, this could be installed on the return line of the research and you take that nice dial on top of that thermo center and dial it into the temperature you want. So let's say we've got 120 out. I'm gonna dial that thermo center to 110 degrees. And then I've got a variable speed pump based on a pressure control mode, proportional pressure control. So this thermo center is gonna open and close as that temperature needs to increase or decrease. So, so now that I've got a valve that's opening and closing, I can all of a sudden run a pressure-based pump. And so what that looks like on the, on the curves is I've got a pump that's responding to valves that are opening and closing. So with that thermo setter, for example, full open, I'd be running out here where this yellow dot is. And then as the thermo setter starts to close down, the pump is going to slow down on proportional pressure control mode towards its minimum curve where it intersects the system curve. You see those two system curves. This is the minimum, this is the maximum. There are infinite number of curves that exist between those two points. So as that valve is opening and closing, it's migrating between the minimum and the maximum on a pressure-based mode. So now we're controlling temperature with a pressure-based smartphone. It's a good combination. So and I kind of took for granted at the beginning that we were talking about wet rotor circulators in this instance, okay, uh, but not in, not in all instances. But typically these circulators that are, are smart pumps and becoming more popular are wet rotor designs, so they're resilient, they're cooled by the system fluid. We don't have maintenance involved with changing seals and oiling bearings, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the ECM motor provides the fact that the motor is gonna run cooler, the pump itself. Um, Potentially, we need less equipment. So if you've got a pump that knows it's GPM and feed of head, I don't need additional sensors, potentially. Uh, I don't need balancing valves or circuit setters in a lot of cases because we're gonna let the pump do that. And in general, uh, it's gonna save money overall because of the efficiency of the circulator and the fact that we're speeding it up and slowing it down to match the actual demand required. How much can we save? So as a general rule, I like to say that ECM circulators, smart pumps can save between 30 to 80 plus percent. I personally have seen projects out there where we've reduced power by 95% over a two year study. And that's a that's documented report by a third party agency. Um, and so these pumps have the ability to change uh, a lot of the power that's being saved to reduce a lot of the power that's being used because we've got these old dead dog pumps. Remember the dead dogs? <laughs> so the opportunity to change them out and save money is definitely, definitely real. Here's a great example. So here locally, we have a, a community, assisted living old folks community. So what you're looking at is a four story building. It's got 48 units of baseboard heat. On the right hand side is a pump that was installed almost four years ago. And these pumps track their power consumption versus lifetime operating hours. So this pump is the only pump that serves the baseboard for 48 units. It has run for 33,752 hours. That's almost four years. And it has used a total power consumption of 2,794 kilowatt hours. If we take that into money, it's 10 cents a kilowatt hour here in Denver. That pump has heated that building in electrical cost of $279 total in four years. So do these pumps save money? Absolutely. We didn't have any data on the old pump that was in there, 
because it wasn't a smart pump. But two hundred eighty dollars to heat a four-story, forty-eight unit complex baseboard, pretty good, pretty okay, as the Danes would say. So I know we've had some questions uh, emailed into us, and so I wanted to just pick a couple of those. One is a, a great question that is more and more uh, common or prominent these days is to ask about, are these pumps susceptible to iron oxide in the system? And the answer is, sure, right? They're magnets. And when you put a magnet in a system with iron oxide, it tends to attract it. Now, some manufacturers have done things to their designs, but as a general statement, um, yeah, they're susceptible to iron oxide. Uh, you can uh, you can definitely go to your friendly Kalefi dealer, and he'll get you a mag filter, <laughs> a mag uh, separator, so we can get that stuff out of the system. Okay, but if you do get them in the pumps, it will it eventually do damage. That being said, certain manufacturers do certain things to do to keep that stuff out of their wet rotor circulators. The longevity of ECM versus standard AC induction motors is, I guess, what I'll compare that to. I don't know. Um, I know we've been selling these ECM type pumps in the US for 11 years, maybe, um, and have had great luck with them for the, the entire period of time. So, as far as motor failures, I'm not seeing a whole lot of those in the market today. This is not new technology. It's been out, ECM technology has been out uh, almost two decades, I guess. And so it's just a little later to the US. So about 2008, I think is when the first versions arrived. And here's another good question. Why wouldn't ECM pumps be the standard for all variable load systems? Excellent question, right? I would say, exactly <laughs> to answer that question so there are there is talk in the industry about um, legislation or department of energy requirements that will eventually do away with non-ecm type circulators in europe they are not allowed to manufacture non-ecm type circulators um, so Eventually it'll come here, but you know, we are talking about the US government and they move very slowly to do things like that. Um, but eventually it will happen. And so I would say that ECM pumps should be the standard for variable load conditions and even non-variable load conditions. Think back to that constant curve control mode. We've dialed the pump into where we want to run it instead of mechanically changing the system burning electricity so even in non-variable load systems i've got an efficient motor running efficiently right a pump running efficiently that is where it's supposed to be and so it's still saving energy and it's still good for the system performance overall so i'll take this opportunity to open it up here to my my distinguished live audience they've been so good we didn't get any cell phone ringing or anything like that if does anyone have a question in the house here Yep. So the question was, how do you use like an ECM circulator as the boiler circulator? And I would say very carefully. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so basically you have friction loss that occurs across that uh, heat exchanger in your boiler, right? And so if you know what that friction loss is, if your pump has constant pressure modes, you could set it for that friction loss set point and it would run across that heat exchanger. Keep in mind, the heat exchanger is nothing then to that pump is nothing more than just another zone. So whatever system curve that heat exchanger has is gonna intersect somewhere with the control curve on that circulator. And that's how you would know where you would set it. It's not gonna vary in speed, right? But it's gonna be dialed into where you want it. Bob, do you have uh, questions from the interwebs? Yeah, similar to that, can a, a constant temperature circulator be set so that it slows down as temperature set point is approached? So uh, maybe a boiler protection mode, so to speak, or do you know that? Absolutely. Uh, in, in most cases, absolutely. Um, so 
what the pump will do is as it's approaching its set point mm -hmm. uh, in temperature mode, as it as it approaches its set point, it's going to actually slow down, right? So you've got a generally speaking, you've got a PI controller, and you can adjust how quickly or slowly that pump is going to ramp up or down to maintain or attempt to hit its set point. Uh, just a quick question here. Maybe you don't know the biggest ECM motor that's available for a pump currently. I mean, how how big are we? I, I don't know in general, but I do know being a Grunfoss representative here in Colorado, uh, we have access to ECM motors up to 15 horsepower currently. Okay. So they're getting bigger and bigger all the time. How does a pump know what the supply versus return temperature is? Obviously, some sensors would be uh, either in the pump or strapped on, right? Exactly. So, in generally, you would have a yeah, you would have a sensor on the supply and a sensor on the return. One thing I did, failed to mention about delta T is you have to have flow to determine delta T. You've got to be moving water, right? So, one consideration if you're doing delta T is you know you've got to move the water in order to establish the delta in the first place. So you never shut it off, off obviously. Yeah, you, you, you could, but you'd have to run it for a certain period of time in order to establish the differential. Um, yeah, I think you did great. I mean, this cleared up a lot for me. Some the explanation together, I think, are the key, you know, seeing the, uh, the picture as well as you explaining it. So thanks for clearing it up and hopefully for everybody else, too. So uh, thanks for having me. My contact information is on the screen if anybody has any questions just don't feel uh don't hesitate to give me a call so thanks for having me bob i'm going to hand it over to you yeah thanks thanks matt and thanks for your team back there supporting you and also for the people that showed up for the live presentation and uh thanks everybody